Hello, welcome to episode 7 of The Outside Fence, brought to you by teachmehorseracing.com. I am your host, Tristan Heffernan. With me, as always, is Stuart Brown. Balls, we return to Mooney Valley for the first time uh, in a, a fair while on a Saturday on the weekend. How did you see the uh, the first meeting of the season there? Uh, yeah, from a personal point of view, I uh, finished with my nose in front, which... Uh is always uh, always helps. It wasn't, I suppose, the greatest meeting I'd ever seen for a Saturday. It was a fairly down meeting. I'd say it'll be sort of the lowest class meeting we'll have for a long while, given that the uh, good horses are only around the corner. A bit of a calm before the storm, you think? Yeah, possibly. So the track had uh, plenty of plenty of rest, I guess you could say, over the last couple of months. No surprise, it seemed to play pretty well. Yeah, it did play well. It actually. Uh, hosted a Ballarat meeting here sort of two or three weeks ago on a Sunday where the rail was out six metres. It was a very heavy track. Uh, so the rail went back to the true on Saturday. So I was a little bit wary going into it. There's obviously going to be about six metres of fresh ground there, um, just where the horses could come wide and make ground or not. Um, now, the track, it did play It played well. It played fair. And most horses would have had their chance. But there probably was not many horses did make that wide looping run. Um, obviously, it's probably disadvantage to do that even at the best of times but um yeah it was sort of hard to make that really wide looping run but it wasn't sort of any kind of savage bias okay you sort of needed to rely on uh some tempo issues going your way to make that looping run which we will touch on a bit later i think you've got something on deck for us balls in uh later in the program but we're going to kick off with race four now this was uh, visually, clearly the most impressive win of the day. Brooklyn Hustle absolutely exploded when she got the gap. Um, she's always looked to be a very promising horse, Balls. Yeah, she has. She was probably the most interesting runner going into the day um, on the car. There she is last at the moment in the red colours. Now, this race is only over a 1,000 metres, so she's probably at a disadvantage already. But I'd say most people mapped her in a sort of pretty similar position. Uh, the other horses to keep an eye out for in this race, the Propel, which is in the red sleeves behind the leader. Um, it runs second, and then also the horse that runs third is a good yarn, which is the horse in front at the moment. So as you can see, it was a very much a rails-dominated race. Um, now, they only went for a 1,000-metre race. They've only gone at a fairly steady tempo here. Um, they haven't sort of broken any records going out. That's allowed the field to stay fairly bunched. Now, you see they'll bunch right up here on the turn, and Brooklyn Hustle, if you're on at the short odds, you're probably a little bit worried at the moment. Now you're probably a bit more happier, but um, she follows the rail through and she's going that well that she can take those tight runs, uh, gets off the leader's heels on sort of early in the straight um, and puts pay to them uh, quite impressively, um, yeah, visually quite impressively. And also, I suppose it was a 1,000 metre race, so you would expect as far as the day goes that they're going to run sort of some of the best sectionals, but she did run the best... Uh, last 600 and 400 of the meeting and the third best last 200. So she's probably gone as well as um, you can probably expect her to go. All right, beauty. We had some gremlins there, so I'm going to put the race back up. Um, really impressive win, but I reckon this raises a few talking points. Uh, first of all is the back marker winning off a slow tempo, which sort of goes against conventional wisdom where... Uh, we're starting to, to move away from this slow speed suits the leaders, fast tempo suits the back markers type of thinking. But this is a, an excellent example of the slow tempo really suiting the horse with a bigger sprint. Yeah, it definitely is. She's always shown uh, throughout her career that she's got a very sharp turn of foot, uh, particularly sort of over 200 metres or so. Like if she, if she sort of can be strung up like that, for a lot of horses that would be a disadvantage. For her, I think it's almost ideal that she has that sort of run and then that gets a late split. And then her, her late, late sectionals um, can be as fast as most horses going around, even in the country. You'd think if she, off that kind of run, she sprints very sharply. Um, now, as mentioned, that wasn't the strongest race she'll uh, ever meet. She did obviously run in the Coolmore and a few other decent three-odd races throughout the spring. Um, so... They'll obviously look to go up in class um, over his next preparation, but she was only first up there, and that was a nice pipe opener for this preparation. Definitely. Now, that I, Propel was probably the only other horse we can really take out of this race. Is that fair to say? 
yeah, her and po- possibly fight you could make some little excuse for as he was sort of off the track and making a wide run, whereas obviously all the place getters were up on the inside, but he still was beaten sort of five or six lengths, so there was a decent margin there. But yeah, Propel, as we mentioned, sat behind the leader there. She had two runs back, both at 1,100. Now, she she's a run-on sprinter, um, so you'd think 1,100 would suit, but she really is a 1,000-metre specialist. I, her first two runs this prep, I hadn't given her much of a chance. She'd been sort of hard in the market, but I've been against her. Uh, but on Saturday, as well as backing Brooklyn Hustle, actually had something on Propel because I was quite happy with her coming back to 1,000 metres. Now, she had every possible chance in the world to win there. as beaten by a far better filly on the day. Um, so as far as following her out of this race, I'd still be a bit wary sort of how she is going for Pell because it was just a run there. There was nothing sort of special about it. And she generally is hard in the market. She's got a sort of career of short SPs. So she's never really going to be too long in her races. So she's the sort of horse, unless she gets like a perfect setup for her, I generally look to oppose her. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about Brooklyn Hustle as we go to the next start. Uh, one of my takeaways in past weeks on the show has been being wary of the horses that look a million dollars off a soft run. Now, if this isn't the absolute prototype for that theory, then I'll give it up. Uh, Obviously, she looked brilliant, but no one who follows racing at all would have missed that run on the weekend. Uh, I cannot see how this horse could possibly be any value to back next start. Is that a fair call to make, or am I getting a little bit carried away? I I can see definitely see where you're coming from, because, as you said, she was visually stunning um that win and also she did have a short sp on the day starting sort of around that six to four mark even a bit shorter uh so she's obviously got that anchor going to the next start and she's a bit of a high she has been a high profile horse most of her career um the thing is i think a horse like her particularly a thousand meters i like her a thousand meters she can go up in class and her racing style will probably be suited because I, don't, I think if they go quicker, it won't hurt her too much. If she can get that sort of suck run, um, she's got the capability of running sectionals that can like beat a lot better horses than she beat on Saturday. So as yet, I would agree. I'd be a bit wary of her price going forward, uh, given that she is a highly spruced horse. But um, yeah, I, I wouldn't put the pen through as far as winning sort of much better races than this. Okay, yeah. No, I'd actually prefer to see it go way, way up in grades in a couple of starts and maybe just try and get a down run in between and get her on the bounce back. Uh, I should mention that was the remembering Mark Goring and Adrian Ledger handicap. Uh, really good initiative on the weekend, just uh, naming these races after the the riders and, and some other industry participants who have passed away. Uh, a really nice touch, that one there. Let's move on to race six. Now, I have a feeling you're going to come off the long run here, Balls, because this is a massive bugbear of yours. It's one of mine, but I'm going to let you have the floor. This is uh, a race that was won by Dexalation, but the whole story of the race was the leader. I'll throw the replay up, Balls, and uh, have at it. Yeah, so, uh, as you said at the start here, the horse we'll talk about first and to look out for is that horse on the inside there in the sort of yellowy type colours, driving up now to lead. Now, that's Condos Express, um, and I pretty much mapped it maybe sitting behind the speed. I didn't think it would lead, but so Michael Walker is the jockey. We've spoken about him previously, about his uh, desire and want to go as slow as possible in front and drop anchor. So as you can see right now, he's got the lead and he's dropping anchor right now, and he's about to make a total mess of this race because he drops anchor. A lot of horses, sort of, particularly those on the inside, like Wilmot Pass, the favourite, who's directly behind it, lose all kind of momentum and as you can see here uh, Campbell Arilla takes off on uh, Santa Catarina the Mike Baroni trained New Zealand uh, horse and while while these horses are out wide with momentum uh, the horses back on the inside are getting held up purely because Walker's dropped anchor there on Condos Express um, and really lost all kind of momentum for horses for his horse and horses behind him it's um it's something that he does quite a lot, Michael Walker, and particularly if you find a race where he is on the leader, um, as we have mentioned before, um, you've got to be sort of wary and there might look a lot of speed on paper or something like that, but if he's on this sort of the designated leader in the race, it's a good chance to sort of know that he's highly likely to drop anchor in mid-race and sort of find a horse that's sort of suited by uh, that kind of tempo in the race. Okay, we're going to watch this replay again. 
And now we'll, we'll look at where these place getters have come from and maybe highlight Wilmot Pass as well just to so we yep. can see the, the traffic issues that they've all come up with when this, this pace went out of the race. But uh... Yep, so Wilmot Pass was a favourite. It was drawn the inside there. It was a bit slow out. So it was the unlucky runner in the race. Uh, but the horse that ran second was Titan Blinders. It's third last at the moment. The eventual winner was Dexalation. Uh, and Dexalation's with the leading pack at the moment. But it's out wide there in the blue with the yellow sleeves. And in the third place get a Scottish Rogue, which is behind it uh, in blue with the blue sleeves with the yellow body and yellow cap. And even the fourth horse is the one that's last, or fifth, fourth or fifth horse is the one that's last at the moment and about to take off. So you can see where they've all come from. And this was a slowly run race. Um, they've all been advantaged or, or not disadvantaged by having momentum out wide. Um, particularly those three that are widest now. Titan Blinders had to take sort of tight runs here. Um, they've all been, whereas the one, the horses back on the inside there were sort of significantly disadvantaged by that big slowdown. Um, so I'd, a horse like Wilmot Pass, I'd, you'd have to forgive for that run. Arguably should have won the race. As you can see, it sort of finishes off well once it gets clear here. But back on these winning horses, Dexalations that have still done a pretty good job to win there. Like it found a bit of trouble on the home turn uh, and sort of toughed it right out. Titan Blinders was the horse I was on. Um, I was concerned with the map going into the race, but I didn't sort of expect it to end up where it did. But it sort of had to take tight runs, um, tight runs on the turn, and it was first up as well. So maybe just ran out a bit of bit of steam in the end. And then Scottish Road um, was sort of advantaged by what went on, and it made nice ground down the outside. But um, it's certainly a race where you can forgive a runner like Wilmot Pass. Yeah, it flashed to the line, Wilmot Pass. So. I don't think that will be lost on too many people, given his uh, starting price there, but definitely no knock there. Uh, that was the Remembering Michaela Claridge and Melanie Tyndall handicap. Uh, let's go now to a proper race. There's no... Oh, I don't even have to check the form. Got to know that Michael Walker wasn't on the leader in this next race, the 2,040-metre Vale Rob Gaylard handicap. Now, this was... I would love if every race went like this because this was an absolute war of attrition. Um, dashing performance by Tavi Run when he took over on the bend. We'll pick it up here at the 1600 with uh, Mossendale running along in front. But uh, Maha Medeus absolutely flying this horse and on the quick backup back in trip but definitely suited by the tempo. And is this possibly the reason it got the win? It could well be. It certainly didn't hurt its chances that they, they have gone along at a fast tempo here. Mossendale in front, as you mentioned. Uh, the horses to look out for are Tavi Run, which is sitting second at the moment, Polly Gray, which is third, and then Maha Medeus is in fifth position at the moment. They pretty much dominate the race. Polly Gray did sit wide till about the 1200, so there's, there's plenty of merit in its run. But, yeah, they, they really start to ramp it up from about here uh, with Mossendale, the roughy in front. But, as you mentioned, um, Maha Medeus was a winner last week over 2400 at Caulfield, so, and he's coming back in trip here to the 2040. So that fast tempo sort of really helped him. He, he obviously is a very fit horse, and he had that sort of staying, staying run under his legs, whereas a horse like Polly Gray was coming off a slowly run 2000 at Flemington. So this race, would have, this race should bring it on big time um, for its next start. But even here, you think Tavi Run sort of maybe has them covered. If anything, the jockey possibly went a bit too soon on Tavi Run. Now, he was only chasing down a ruffie in Mossendale who was always going to come back to him. But he sort of got an itchy trigger finger around the sort of six, 700 metre mark and went for home there. As you can see, he's still bobbing in front, but um, gets tied late and these two run over the top of him. Maha Day is too strong. Now, back on, back on Polly Gray. Um, as I mentioned, he came off a slowly run 2000 at Flemington last start where he didn't have a huge, when she didn't have a huge amount of luck. Um, into this fast run race now. Um, the other thing with Polly Gray, early in the straight there, you would have noticed he, she wanted to duck in a bit too, so that wouldn't have helped her chances, and she probably lost a little bit of momentum um, in doing that. Um, so she's definitely a horse to follow, and if she can find a similar race to that over 2,000 metres next start, um, I'd be very happy to be with her. Yeah, she's she's featured on the show a little bit here, Polly Gray, we've... You've been singing her praises for sure. I want to go back and have a look at this replay again. So we touched on the previous... Uh, well, we touched on Brooklyn Hustle's race about the slow tempo 
Um, but the back markers, well, she came from last Brooklyn Hustle. We looked at that race just before with um, Michael Walker, and again, the back markers featured on the slow tempo. This time, on the strong tempo, we have a look where these horses have come from. Uh, Maha Medeus and Polly Gray are probably in the ideal spots, just around midfield. Um, where they're not totally gassed like maybe Taveran was, and obviously the leader proved to be. But they don't have that big, that big task ahead of them from from well back in the field, and uh, I think that's a a massive thing to keep in mind when you're reviewing these really fast run races and the really pressure contests. That uh, common wisdom sort of says that if you're right at the back, that you're the last man standing. But it's obviously uh, it's often too big an ask to get into the field, into the race from that far back, and it's those horses that are able to travel midfield that, that tend to show up. It is, there's definitely a sweet spot in those sort of really fast run races where you want to be where you're not having to make up too much ground on the leaders and then when everything's sort of I suppose everything's tired you're there right away in a striking position uh, to sort of take advantage of it yeah. you can see you can see a lot of those horses from out the back they just haven't got into it because of the speed they've gone on particularly from say sort of the 1000 1200 meter mark they flashed a bit late like Sir Pippins railed up and ran fairly well for fourth um, but horses like Dan on Roman, who was trying to circle, uh, they just had no hope the way the race was run. Yeah, it's circling there. It's hard enough coming from the back, but if you've got a circle on these fast paces with uh, and what was a very fair track, um, good luck to you. One, one thing a very good jockey once told me, uh, these thoroughbreds are quite weak animals and they do get sick of chasing. And uh, I've never forgotten that. And I think you see it time and time again, especially in these... These fast run races, they just uh, they just have enough. And to be honest, my athletic abilities, I don't blame them because I don't have enough as well. Um, we're going to move into the questions section now of the show. We've got one from Joe who had a big weekend the week before and he got his question in too late for last week's episode. And he was still going, judging by this question, because we've discussed it. We're not 100% sure uh, where he's going with it, but we'll do our best to answer it. Now, he's written in, when putting together a profile for a horse, what is the most likely to surprise you race to race? Is there anything that regularly has more variance than anything else? Um, do you want to try and translate that one for the viewers, Balls? Uh, I, I tried. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of a confusing question, I suppose. When you, uh, we have talked about profiling horses, I suppose, a bit on the show. I suppose when it comes to profiling horses, it's more about, I suppose, their characteristics and what they do, uh, what they like, what they don't like, what their racing style is and things like that. And then once you've got that profile, once they go into a race, then you can sort of put their profile against the profile of their competitors in the race and then the conditions on the day. And then hopefully that sort of spits out the winner. But, um, yeah. I'll jump in. I had a go at this. Um, a few... S- particular characteristics of horses that i think can uh if they don't get things that they like they can run considerably worse uh one would be leaders who don't get to lead uh some of these horses when they don't get to lead like they like they don't get beat five lengths they get beat 20 lengths um it doesn't matter to me if they, if they don't get the lead i just totally forget go on if you're going to find a race where they do get the lead go back on that form if they get beat five 10 20 lengths doesn't matter um second one is a horse we talked about last week jungle edge wet trackers on dry ground um doesn't matter how good they're going on the wet if they get back on the dry you can basically put the pen through them and the third one is distance specialists um the one i'm really keen on um sticking with the the real the horses that really zero in on their favorite trip is these 1400 meter horses um who can't quite go with the the strong tempos at 1200 and they don't quite run a mile but uh at 1400 was their their pet trip they can run incredibly well at 1400 while being rather plain at uh, distances either side so there's there's three situations i guess to look for where uh if horses don't get things their own way they can run a lot worse than um than maybe you, you might otherwise think they would so don't penalize them too heavily there uh Thanks again, Joe. Uh, Keep sending them in. Good on you. All right. We're going to move into, well, our only segment that's turned into takeaway of the week. Balls, any more KFC for you this week or 
taste buds add something else for the. No, I uh, stayed away from the KFC, but um, yeah, it's it's not a bad drop when you're not feeling too well because <laughs> it's because of a self inflicted wound. <laughs> Right, let's. Uh, oh, yeah, we'll let you go again first this week. I'll. Uh, I think you've got a little, a little video replay that I'll have to get up on deck as you talk us through this one. Yep. So my uh, takeaway of the week is to do with wide barriers in small fields, which um, I suppose you don't hear a lot about generally, um, or particularly in the media. Uh, you see barrier draws in small fields not even talked about or disregarded as if well they don't matter like it's every horse will just find their spot anyway which obviously does happen on occasions um as opposed to big fields if there's a big field and the horse is drawn barrier 20 um you don't stop hearing about it um so yeah my my takeaway generally like personally i pay more importance on barriers in small fields than big fields Generally, with a big field, you're going to get a genuine tempo. You're probably going to get, so the horses will spread out a bit. You're going to probably get lines of three, so plenty of opportunities to get cover if that's what you wanted. Um, I just don't think barrier draws matter that much um, in big fields. Well, whereas small fields, generally, you're going to get a slower tempo, um, which means they, they sort of don't spread out as much. So unless you're a leader, um, it's hard to sort of sl- slot into a position or... Um, other jockeys, particularly for a favourite, other jockeys are going to, it's easier for them to look out on sort of where the favourite is and sort of ride against it to a degree, make life hard for it. Um, so an example of this, I suppose, was uh, race one on Saturday at Mooney Valley. The short price favourite, um, which went up absurdly short when markets first went up, was Victoria Star. Now it was drawn barrier six of six. So a lot of people would say field of six, why does it matter, like, what barrier you're drawn? Every horse is going to get their chance. Now, it's a horse that doesn't lead, usually, um, and there was actually riding instructions given that was later broadcast in the stewards' report um, that the horse was instructed to settle forward behind the leaders. Now, that was a race on paper where there was a slow tempo, or I predicted there'd be a slow tempo. There wasn't a huge amount of speed, as you'd expect, with only six horses. Now, for that horse to jump from barrier six and settle behind the leaders... On a, from a slow tempo seemed a pretty difficult task to me given there were probably other horses in the race who wanted that spot and they weren't going to go that hard early um, for it to find a spot. Now, um, if you can just chuck the vision up now, Hef. Absolutely, I can. Here we go. As you see in the replay here, it's the horse drawn the outside with the white sleeves, Craig Newt in the saddle. Um, and so he's riding along a bit early um, to find that spot behind the leaders. Now, as you can see, everything sort of kicked up inside him. They would have known the favourite's drawn where it is. And he's ended up having to do a fair bit of work and going to the front there, which is sort of not his racing style, but also he's burned a fair bit of petrol um, getting there. And he's tried to slow up here, but now he's sort of he's got company as well. So um, that was sort of the end of his day. He ended up running second last, tiring sort of from the home turn onwards. Um, so it's, I, I think part of my reasoning being against that horse on Saturday was I just thought the map looked very tricky for it, even though there were only six horses in the race. Now, it could have gone, if it went back, maybe the tempo of the race would have, would have, wouldn't have been much at all. And so it might have found it hard to um, get into the race. Um, given it would probably would have had to circle the field uh, off a slow tempo and the leaders probably would have got going when they know that horse is um, starting to circle. So I think if you're doing your form, um, I just pay special attention to, to barriers in those small fields and just make sure you obviously you've got your mapping, um, mapping right down to where it should be. Very good. Excellent example there, I think, Bowles. Uh, even when it did find the front, it then had a bit of pressure to its outside. The horse really never gets into it. Into no. a rhythm, but yeah, easy. I think to say through barrier two or three, they probably just jump out nice and comfortable on it and know they'll just slot into a nice spot somewhere. But just even that few horses wider barrier six, um, in a field of six, um, it just made that a little bit more difficult for it. Very good. I'm gonna stay on this small field, slow tempo sort of wavelength as well with my takeaway this week. And mine is to beware of small margins in slowly run races, uh, which obviously can often happen in these small fields. Uh, Now, weaker horses can be extremely flattered in these type of races uh, when the races are run slow enough for them to travel comfortably, even if they're out of uh, 
against better horses, uh, and the longer it takes for that pressure to go on at the finish, the less distance there is for the better horses to run away from them. So when you see these horses coming back in grade off a small beaten margin, be very wary if they're coming out of a slowly run race because it's sort of going to disguise how... Uh, it's going to disguise their level and, and maybe uh, how inferior they were in, the, in that higher grade. So, uh, And you also get the double whammy that they're coming out of a slow race, which can be a disadvantage in itself if they're going up in trip or they're still working towards peak fitness and they, they haven't really had that run to bring them on. So one that, that's, that's a horse I'm really, really wary of. The horse coming back in grade off a, uh, a small beaten margin when they're up in grade when they're flattered because of that slow tempo and uh yeah obviously you'll see them go around uh, under the odds more often than not i think um yeah. that's a good piece of advice i think you like that one balls i do excellent well we're all that's set now for slow tempos like next week next time michael walker's on a leader we are set um beauty what have we got coming up this week uh i assume we're not back to caulfield yet uh, no, we've got Flemington this Saturday. So the feature race is the Ori Star um, down the straight over 1,200. It used to be, well, traditionally a bit of a kickoff point for a lot of spring horses. It's sort of not the case these days. I assume there'll be a few um, spring uh, spring horses who might be first up in it as well. There's a uh, little bit of rain forecast in Melbourne this week, but not a huge amount. But I'd expect the track's probably maybe just into the soft range. I wouldn't have thought it's too, uh, too rain affected. So... Um, I will say, just looking at the early noms for the race, if it if the race if the track was say a six or worse, I'd I'd happily be on grade again in the race, um, given its last run. But I'd I'd want sort of a, a soft six or worse before I um, before I got interested. Okay, he came through the Bletchingly, didn't he? He did, yes. Now what that was run on a dry ground, which I don't think sort of suitable for him, and he he wasn't beaten too far, so um, I think he's going pretty well at the moment. Go back to episode six and uh, and have a listen to what Balls thought of a run there. Uh, great again, excellent. Uh, we'll cross the fingers too, Balls. And um, thoughts go out to everyone in Victoria at the moment. There's obviously plenty going on. There was good news today that racing is going to continue. Uh, they've shown that they can hold these meetings uh, through this COVID period before. So let's hope that uh, that everyone sticks to the rules and we can keep racing going on for as long as possible. So. Uh, Thanks again for your time, Balls. Uh, I would look forward to uh, seeing you next week to discuss Flemington. No worries. Thanks uh, Thanks again. And thanks to everyone for watching. Don't, uh, don't forget to, to give us a like or a subscribe or a bit of love on Twitter, and we'll see you all next week. Thanks very much.